Hi, my name is Megan Huber, and in this video, I will discuss how overground gait patterns change when hip stiffness is modulated using a robotic exoskeleton. This collaborative work was done by myself along with colleagues Jungwoo Lee, Vipa Agarwal, Haley Warren, and Neville Hogan. Lower limb exoskeleton technology has dramatically improved in the past several decades, and nowadays with advances in mechatronics and batteries and mechanical and user design, we have exoskeletons that are lightweight, portable, and easy to wear. Uh, the Samsung hip exoskeleton, as shown here, is just one example of the many devices that are out there now. However, how to best control these devices is still an open question. And the reason why how to control an exoskeleton is a challenging research question is because of the simple fact that humans are adaptive. Uh, from human neuromotor control and learning studies, we know that human behavior changes over multiple timescales, and it can be affected by multiple factors, one of which is practice schedule. Thus, it's important to characterize how the human responds to a given exoskeleton input, as that response tells us the following. First, it tells us what applications a certain exoskeleton controller is suitable for. For instance, when you're trying to augment or assist a human, the goal behavior is defined for the coupled human-robot system, whereas for rehabilitation, a goal behavior is defined for the human once that robot is removed. Thus, it's important to quantify how the human responds during intervention when the exoskeleton is on, but also what that response is after it removes. And that will tell you whether this exoskeleton controller is more suitable for assistance versus rehabilitation. The second thing this response tells you is what protocol or procedure is needed in order to ultimately optimally tune a controller for a given user. In this study, we repeatedly applied either positive or negative hip stiffness using the Samsung hip exoskeleton as shown here. And we subsequently quantified the changes in spatial and temporal patterns during overground walking. Here we define the stiffness controller used in our experiments. We emulated a virtual spring in between the two legs and set the stiffness value to either positive or negative five newton meters per radian. Essentially, the positive stiffness controller acted to push the legs together, whereas the negative stiffness controller acted to pull the legs apart from one another. As for the experiment itself, four healthy adults participated. Each participant performed a total of eight walking trials, and each trial consisted of 120 strides, again, overground in a long straight hallway with low foot traffic. In the first two trials, which were considered baseline trials, participants walked with the exoskeleton on, but it was not powered. In the remaining six trials, Participants walked for 20 strides and then the robot was turned on or powered and it remained so for the next 50 strides and then it was turned off and remained off for the remaining 50 strides. Participants performed three trials with negative stiffness applied and then another three with positive stiffness applied. Uh, these trials were performed in a blocked manner and the blocks were counterbalanced. After data collection, we then calculated the following for each individual stride. The stride time, the range of motion of the relative angle between the two legs, as well as the range of motion of the right and left leg individually, as well as the maximum values and minimum values of each leg independently. For our first analysis of the data, we asked the following two questions. One, do short applications of hip stiffness affect gait behavior? And two, how does this effect evolve with repeated applications? And so to address these two questions, we perform the following analysis. For each stiffness condition, positive and negative, we performed a two by two within subject uh, analysis of variance, or ANOVA, on each measure. Our first factor, controller state, was either on or off. And then we had a second factor, which was trial, which was either trial number one, two, or three. The results of this analysis yielded the following. First, we found that adding negative hip stiffness increased the average stride time, but adding positive stiffness had no effect on mean stride time. And then in both cases, positive or negative stiffness, 
neither had any effect on the variability or standard deviation of stride time. And you can see this in the two figures to the right. Now turning to the spatial measures, we found that adding positive stiffness decreased the range of motion of the relative angle between the two legs, and adding negative stiffness increased this range of motion. Importantly, we found that this was consistent across the two legs, that the range of motion of each individual leg either increased or decreased depending on whether um, negative or positive stiffness was applied respectively. And as you can see, their maximum and minimum value, uh, values follow this pattern. In addition, we found that the effect of either adding positive or negative stiffness did not change across trials. Thus, we conclude that applying hip stiffness induced quantifiable changes in gait kinematics, and these changes were consistent across exposures. Next, we asked, do short applications of hip stiffness affect baseline gait behavior? And to do this, we compared gait behavior when the robot was off in the following three conditions. So at the end of the very last baseline trial, so that those last 50 strides, we compared that to the last 50 strides when again the robot was off in the very last trial of the negative stiffness condition. And same thing, the last trial when the robot was off in the positive stiffness condition. And we compared each dependent measure across these three conditions with a one-way within subjects ANOVA. In other words, what we're doing with this analysis is looking for any after effects of applied hip stiffness. Ultimately, this ANOVA revealed that there was no effect of condition on any dependent measure. In other words, there are no after effects of applying hip stiffness. This can be seen in the face portraits for each sub subject shown below. When you have positive stiffness applied, as shown in the light blue, you see a smaller orbit for all subjects. And when you apply negative stiffness, you see a larger orbit shown in purple. What you'll also notice is that there are three lines or three orbits that are plotted on top of one another. Baseline, negative stiffness off, and positive stiffness off. The last two indicated with dashed lines. And what this is showing is that gait behavior, no matter whether positive or negative stiffness was applied, ultimately returns back to baseline as soon as that applied stiffness is removed. In fact, if you look at the strides at the transition from either turning the stiffness controller on or off, you see that either adaptation or de-adaptation occurs within one stride. In other words, for instance, if you turn the controller on, you'll see immediate gait changes within one stride, and those changes persist for the next 50 strides. When you turn that controller back off, subjects immediately go back to what their baseline behavior was, again, within one stride, and again, don't change behavior for the remaining 50 strides. To summarize, our results showed that applying hip stiffness, positive or negative, induced quantifiable changes in gait kinematics. The change in behavior was consistent across repeated exposures. In other words, there were no after effects. And adaptation and de-adaptation occurred within one stride. And while not shown here, if you refer to the paper, these findings were consistent with those reported during treadmill walking. And these results are significant for the following reasons. First, the lack of any observation of after effects suggests that this may not be an appropriate controller when it comes to rehabilitation. Two, applying hip stiffness does not appear to interfere with the underlying neural control of locomotion, meaning that this may be a viable option when it comes to assisting or augmenting human locomotion. And lastly, because the time scale of adaptation or, and de-adaptation is very quick within one stride, that means personalizing this controller to an individual will not require extensive testing. If you have any further questions or would like to discuss this further, please reach out to either myself or my colleague Jung Woo Lee.